my day to day is essentially doing a series of services on what we now call BIM, but focusing particularly, and that's probably what differentiates what we do, is focusing on what we call, I will say, badly call Open BIM, and try to stay away from what I tend to call vendor BIM. And essentially what we do is most of it is around the topics of collaboration and coordination, information exchange, and that type of thing. Hey friends, welcome back to BIM Voice. Today, I have the pleasure to talk to Nando Mogojon from Australia. Hi Nando, thank you for joining me. Hi Pedro, well done with my surname. I typically don't do that, but <laughs> you have done your research. Yes, my name is Nando Mogolan or Mogollon, as I will pronounce it in my native Spanish language. Not from Spain, though. I'm from South America in Colombia, but yeah, it, it is Mogollon. Very well done. Thank you. I practiced a bit with you before <laughs> starting recording, so <laughs> it's fine to admit that. You've been living for a long time in Australia? Not really. Depends on how you want to say it. Re I've been here since 2015, so that's going to be nine years, close to 10. But I came the long way. I started my professional life in Colombia, graduated from architecture after almost graduating from engineering. I uh, late in my career decided to jump to architecture and never went back to engineering, civil engineering, by the way, which I think was a good decision. All things counted, I believe. But I went I came to Australia the long way. I first time going outside was uh, a job experience in South Africa back in 2010 for the FIFA World Cup in 2010. So I got involved in a couple of fairly large scale projects there. I got invited by Colombian director of a South African company to whom I owe pretty much my later exposure to both BIM and the international market, I guess. From then, I went to Canada the first time, got involved in a project in northern Canada. And me being from Colombia and South America, particularly from the Caribbean part of Colombia, I found it very challenging to deal with the minus 40 degrees. Oh, <laughs> it's only a few months, but still. So yeah, got there, did a bit of work with a really nice company, very nice people, but couldn't stay for too long, really. Then found another opportunity to work in China. Then I went to Shanghai. I worked there for about a year to do pretty much an implementation, an introduction to Beam to a Chinese company. Then came back to, went back to Canada, but that time was to Vancouver. Got involved in a really nice and challenging project. The kind of project that challenges the, the physics and gravity and the structure of the building. So that was also a nice experience. And then from then around 2014 or so, I ended up, I started having conversations and ended up jumping on the boat and well, on the plane actually, and landed in Sydney in January, 2015. And since then pretty much stayed here though. Okay. That sounds like a nice, uh, good place to be in. I had a few guests from there. It is a very very nice place in the planet like this area of the of the world is it's as charming as you can imagine yeah yeah okay that's cool that's cool what do you do to today now what are you involved with today so as you know i'm an architect but uh, what i do today is i work as a beam consultant and the director of build digital which is a uh, beam services company and my day-to-day -day is essentially doing series of services on what we now call BIM, but focusing particularly, and that's probably what differentiates what we do, is focusing on what we call, I will say, badly call open BIM, and try to stay away from what I tend to call vendor BIM. And essentially what we do is most of it is around the topics of collaboration and coordination, information exchange, and that type of thing. That sounds interesting. So are you working with only one client or uh, with more clients? No, we do have a few clients uh, ranging from construction companies, uh, developers mostly, and architectural companies. As you know, the, the challenges of information exchange 
several phases, you know, from the point of view of what ISO 19650 calls the the appointing party, so the client itself, in most cases, I get involved by working and representing that client. So that will be playing the information manager from the client point of view, Mm -hmm. uh, sort of doing the coordination, requesting models, validating those models, doing the full uh, cross-disciplines coordination. And some of the times I play a similar role, information management or on the BIM side, but by representing the architectural company. So uh, some companies, maybe they just don't have enough capacity. Most of them know that what they're doing, but sometimes it's just a the lack of skills that forces them to look for third parties that can give them a hand and uh, help them with the deliverables that they more often now than before they need to meet. Interesting. Yeah, that's cool. So you work mostly with clients and architects from that perspective, not from the designer or the builder. I work for a general contractor, right? And it, it's a bit different. Well, the developer is kind of the general contractor. Uh, terms is say similar. So uh, in that case, I won't be modeling anything. I'll be requesting models to be delivered to me, to my client, and I'll represent them. And then I'll say, yeah, this is fine. This is not fine. You're going to have to go and change this. And from then on, you get going. Some of the times, again, I play on the other side of the table and then representing one of the designers by saying, all right, but show me what we need to deliver. Show me what, we, what we've got thus far. And then let's see how can we meet the requirements as they're given. And then, you know, having to push back every now and then because, you know, we're still living in that world where even though we call, we still live in the world that deals with what we normally call beam washing, where you, you see a document that is written apparently in fairly plain neutral language only to discover that what they actually meant was a particular brand or something like that. So well, we have to do some level of negotiation trying to say, hey, but sure, I can deliver that. But really, for instance, a uh, typical situation will be, look, I understand that work sets, it's a one-sided thing. I can't really give you work sets because IFC doesn't really have a work set. We can, we can subdivide that. We can give you classifications. We can give you groups or you tell me what to do with information but probably let's stay away from the work sets and then you have to negotiate and and uh, make sure that you deliver as per the contracts and help the parties to get along in that way that's cool is it only you or uh, do you have uh, are you more other team the build digital started with just me at some point i have to go and get help which I did. Then I have to change that, uh, not hiring directly, but by you know doing agreements with other companies locally and externally. So I do have, it's a strange, the way companies build their teams these days, it's not quite the classical way. You just gather a lot of money by go fundraising and then start hiring people and hiring marketing and all of that. I've had uh, the experience of having a, a different sort of organic growth and the fact that there is so much, I believe, due to what COVID did with the communications like this and the remote work and the facility to exchange data and keep the information going almost live with an infinite number of applications that help with messaging and meetings, I ended up just getting a number of other either individuals or companies that helped me with the incrementing the manpower. So currently, I actually work with a couple of companies internationally. I have a very good friend of mine that used to work with me in a past uh, work experience who's a programmer. And he does, he's, I used to do a little bit of that, but look, it's a field that requires a very good knowledge. You know, you, you want someone to be dedicated to that. So he's, he covers that every now and then whenever we need to do anything related to APIs, basically. And then, you know, and a typical thing, sometimes you just need all hands you can on the deck to get some project going. And, and then I basically take the job of supervising, filtering and approving, and then we go ahead. But, you know, everything needs to go through my eyes because any consulting services of almost any kind doesn't really apply to architecture or even BIM has its weight on trust. What that means is when you hire a consultant, you're actually trusting someone to get something done. But if you know that that person is going to send it to another person, 
then your trust goes a little, like a little one notch down because then you don't know, okay, what's the quality that I'm going to get if I, I know you, Petro, I know you, you do your work well. If I'm delivering something and I need your help, it's because I need your help and not that I need you to find someone else to give me some help, right? So almost everything needs to go through my eyes, mostly because of that. Consulting is a reputational type of work. Mm. Yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense. It doesn't help sometimes that I give unfiltered opinions, though, on particularly on Twitter, which is what we ended up engaging lately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's cool. Thank you for joining the conversations. I really enjoy it. And it's cool to have a lively debate every time uh, there is a reason for that. Yeah. It's a friendly debate. So if I ever, you know, if you see me coming hard at you, it's uh, you have to remind, <laughs> remember that I do it with a lot of care and um, all my love to the conversation. It's all supposed to be <laughs> constructive. Don't worry. I, to be honest, I appreciate honesty. That's the most important. As long as you don't swear to me or something like that and be, just be honest, tell your opinion. I like, we are entitled to our uh, own uh, opinions and I don't learn anything if you will have the same opinion as myself. I appreciate thinking differently. <laughs> just shoot it out. Honestly, you stand to. It's, it's perfectly fine. I've seen that you have taken that master in BIM at Ziggurat. What can you tell us about that? Correct. So I took that, I think it was uh, four years ago or three years ago, something like that. The one, and I have to say before I say anything else, I will give you a biased opinion because I'm also teaching now. Oh, you are teaching there now. Okay. Yes. So it is biased in the sense that because I know some inner works, I will, I know what's happening inside and outside. Plus, I also was a, a student of the master and then have a, some sort of a perspective from what was going on back then and what's going on now. It has changed. That's the first thing you need to know. It has changed through the years, adapting to the needs, both the needs of the market, the standards that are coming out. For instance, when I was joining, there was no ISO 19650 or it was only uh, chapter one and two. So we didn't know about a lot more than just the basic concept. So most of Standards were different. The market was asking for more modelers than anything else. So now, for instance, there's much more emphasis on data management, likely because, you know, all the standards around the world that have been aligning with the ISOs are insisting on focusing on information management rather than just the sake of producing models and do some uh, geometrical class detection, if you like. So it is more focused about that. It is really nice to hear that. It is also one of the few masters with the degree, well, on the one hand, it has a degree that is valid as per the University of uh, Barcelona, on the one hand, and on the, on the other hand, it is nice in the sense, which is one of the reasons why I made a decision to take it, it is nice because it's, it's not driven by a single vendor, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Which is what happens with most of the educational material you find online. And that gives you a very nice perspective and take on multiple different applications. When you see that, then you get to find what is common about all of them. The ones you like and the ones you don't like. The fact that it forces you to take a different view and sit on different chairs on, around the same table forces you to take the perspective of, okay, what's, what's a common matter? What is the things that regardless of the software we always have to deal with, right? And then Again, it all starts spinning up, it's spinning around the core of the concept of BIM, which is, as you have seen me ranting every now and then, which is the whole idea of interoperability, not compatibility, exchanging information for the sake of collaborating, which is not the same as, say, round trips, all these kind of misconceptions that we deal with every now and then. It enforces the concept that, look, there's no question that something like IFC works. It might not be the best thing ever. I completely agree with some concepts from some people that actually say, oh, we have to get rid of IFC. IFC is actually the problem. To where I say, look, I agree. Nobody's saying it's perfect. Two by three, which is the one that most people will use in active projects, it's already like 10 or 12 years old. So no wonder it's falling short from its capabilities and it has limitations. IFC 4 is going to be like five years old pretty soon. It's just that the adoption by different houses of software, it's not as quick. 
also because the acceptance and validation of those pieces of software to use the standard also takes time and it's a long process and well. Sorry for interrupting. Building Smart has important implication in this and they need to step their game up regarding the certification process, which is very slow at the time, yes. And they are aware about it. That's the good part. And uh, there are more people that have started to work there lately and I hope to see an improvement on that in the next years. Hopefully. You know, to wrap it up, yes. So I did take the course. When I did it was slightly different. The way we run it, now, we directed by uh, Stefan Mordu, who you probably want to, you may try get him on the podcast. He might give you a good conversation. He's the director of the entire masters on the academic side, let's say. So he's the one sort of giving him a sense of direction, which is nice. And currently it's running every semestral thing. So you can jump on it uh, middle of the year, end of sort of end of the year, if you want to start on, on the new year. And they're taking students. It's quite a lot of people taking that. It has very nice things, particularly yeah. that. We'll set it apart is the fact that if you want to jump into something like this without having a single-sided, heavily biased understanding of BIM, then that is probably a good master's to take. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. You mentioned something very interesting, that there was a shift from focus on modeling, creating uh, random and uh, lots of data to information management. What do you see as the biggest challenges to spread this even more further? How do we tackle this? What, what are the main challenges and how do we tackle them? Well, there, there are several things that happens. Uh, one big challenge I still believe is the misconceptions. But misconceptions, I'll put it in a second stay uh, on the second level because I think the first level, the first obstacle, the biggest wall you get is you need the information to be requested. You can't just come up with information and share information because you like to. It's absolutely pointless. As much as you love it, and I like it, and I, I love to see a really nice federated model that is super rich in information in a way that you could almost avoid drawings uh, because you can simply just drag everything from the models. But nobody's asking it. Nobody's using that information for absolutely anything. So what's the point? So the first wall is you want information to be requested by the owner, what the ISO 9650 will call the appointing party, right? The client. Uh, hopefully not only the developer, the construction company, because the whole effort ends at the construction. And even though that would be nice, right? So getting the models to be operative for sequencing and costing that would be nice. Not only the cross, regular cross discipline coordination, but even that, having the information being requested by a general contractor, then you know that, well, if it stops there, we're probably going to be better than not doing it, but then won't get any, any way before or after that. You would like that to be requested by actually the operator of the building, if it's a large building or a hotel or a facility that requires um, some level of facilities management or actual operation. And then you know that you're putting information that is actually valuable. There's value on throwing that into the model, not just putting a note on your drawings. And then there is an argument that, all right, it is reasonable that's going to be paid off, therefore made it contractual in having requesting that as part of your model. So first thing need to be that, you know, you don't want to push BIM because you wanted it to do it, right? You, you want to have the whole concept of being a, re, being a response mm -hmm. to what the project is requiring, what the client is requiring. I really need to know. It's like, and it comes down to uh, fairly simple things. You can't argue that a client will ever say, I really need to know how much this project is going to cost me, right? Mm -hmm. Not only the, the building itself, but the process of getting the building done. I need to know how much is this going to cost me beforehand. I need to know if I have the money for this. I need to know if I need to go fundraising. So if they know that, right, and they know they can use models to simulate the costing and taking the quantities off and so on, you're already making a gain. Mostly what happens is that the clients doesn't even know or they have a hint that that may do, but they completely delegate that decision down to the general contractor. And then the general contractor may or may not have an interest on in that. They probably have a team of estimators that 
in any case, they're probably going to do measuring from the PDF or who knows what. And then all of that requirement for information goes out of the window because down the chain, there is no awareness or not enough information about the fact that that can be facilitated if you request information from the authors. So the first wall, I say the first uh, obstacle will be having the information being requested. Second one, once information is requested, then you get to face plenty of multiple misconceptions. And I, th these are probably the ones that I that really triggers me, particularly when I see them on Twitter or something like that. And then you start responding and then you got all sort of opinions and so on. Commonplace, particularly for anyone out there that is not using main and most common brands of software, right? And then you get uh, information requirements. Now they call it like that because they have seen it that is out of fashion to call it just anything else. So now they call it like that, but it's just a change in title. And then still you find things like work sets, or then you need to join a particular brand of cloud service. And then they completely ignore the fact that, well, but, but you're going to be hiring a lot of companies and people that may not be using that brand. Are you going to force them to use that? Like, is, is this really the, the way we want to go? You want to narrow down your options only to those doing that? Look how crazy that is. If you just simply move to another briefly make a short analogy move to another market let's go to transport and let's say that now you need to trans you have you're the director of a school you need to take all the kids to a road trip we need to take all of these you know 300 kids down to a trip to the beach great let's define the minimum requirements okay let's do that we need buses we need the bus to be this big we need good drivers great that's all great let's put that down in the requirements and then they say, oh, by the way, they need to be Volkswagen. I won't take anything but a Volkswagen. So, but hold on. What if the Volkswagen driving is a bad driver? You are funny. You are really funny. This is an amazing analogy, actually. Imagine you're requesting an Uber, but then you say, oh, but I only take a Toyota Camry. I won't, I won't get on, on a Tesla. I'm, I'm not going to jump on anything else. You're yeah. narrowing down your, your opportunities of success just by doing that. So that's one big misconception, which is the one that I typically, my rant about that generally goes around the lines of, and sorry for Boyana from the last podcast you did, or not the last one, but the previous one, I can't recall, because I don't really see it as open beam versus closed beam. You have seen me saying this. Uh, and the reason why not is because I think open beam is a term that it was a blessing in the beginning, but it's a hindrance at the moment. Why? Because you're letting individual brands run away with the concept of BIM. Because what you're saying is, oh, I'm not BIM, I'm open BIM. Like yeah. if it was a weird kind of way of developing this idea, right? When it is not. What really is, is either BIM or a version of BIM that I tend to call vendor BIM. Well, I don't call it, I actually borrow, not to say stole the term from the Omolt you have got in the podcast um, to plenty of times. And it's vendor beam. It's just pushing for a single brand and forcing that to happen. Not that all brands do that because it is clear to me that some brands of software are much more open to the collaboration uh, compared to other ones. But it is clear to me that the concept of open beam loses when compared to simply call it beam, which is the, the regular process of exchange information based on interoperability. I'm not expecting to do round trips. I'm, I'm expecting to collaborate with you as much as I can. But we need to do that regardless of the limitations of your software, his software, someone else's software, right? When you just narrow it down to what I call vendor beam, then you're facing something else. And then you go into problems, mainly compatibility, because then only those, say, applications or formats that are perfectly compatible with the other one will be able to exchange information, right? So that is exchange information only within the limits of those pieces of software. I still don't know why that's any better, right? So that's, those are terrible misconceptions. Also, you know, talk about that for a lot of time, but the problem of the vendor beam, if you like to put it, it's, it, it, it leads to tribalism, which happens a lot, particularly on social media. It's used for beam washing easily because then you go and say, uh, take a course on beam. And then you open the cover, see the second page is no, no, he just wants to teach me this one software, not being, <laughs> but it's used to, it's used as, as bait pretty much. So that, you know, those misconceptions, 
same as with the idea of IFC just being IFC the .ifc file, for instance, or um, hopefully won't happen with IDS, which is your one of the topics you have been touching lately. I hope, I really hope that we learn the lessons from IFC and do not fall prey of the same thing with IDS because IDS eventually will be a file hmm. .ids, which is in a format, exactly format in XML. Great choice, I think. By the way, you can get IFC data formatted as XML. It just that it's, it has its ups and downs and so on. But people don't, don't really conceive that. And there's this misconception, once again, that IFC is a format that it's broken and it will never make it work and so on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So those misconceptions, I think, are the second level thing. But they, they are so ingrained in depth that they represent a big hassle and you actually need to work hard to get around them. Okay. So you don't like the term open beam because it leaves the opportunity for this company to still hide behind this concept. Uh, if I understand this correctly, because what these companies saying that they are doing open beam, how they brand this is they actually saying that they are doing open beam because they support ifc because they can read ifc files most i'm talking now about ifc uh, viewers model viewers it has a little bit more nuance to that but globally it can be wrapped up around the concept of oh yeah you're saying you're you're doing open beam just because you can import and export an ifc mm -hmm. okay and just to be clear i was completely on it on top of it to the point that I actually had a Twitter account, you know, 10 or 12 years ago when I was really on this, I had a Twitter account, I have a blog that was called Open Beamer, and I really was pushing, and every every time that I had the chance, I would really try to push the idea of this because I, I saw it as a, a big opportunity to get this going with a brand that was catchy and, and logo and everything else. And it was nice, but we have reached a level of maturity that makes the term, not the concept, the term, mm -hmm. a hindrance. Okay. You have a name for those who are doing things with IFC as if it was subset of BIM. Uh -huh. Okay. Like if it was downstream from BIM. So you got BIM and then you have two kinds, open BIM or enclosed BIM. Not true. The concept of BIM was really always open BIM. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Right? So as a name, just like with analogies, they take you to some extent and then you have to leave them behind. To me, it's obvious. Well, it became obvious. It wasn't obvious all the time. I actually changed opinions on this. I was on the opinion that we had to call it Open Beam just to make sure that we understood what we were talking about. But then I changed my opinion on it when I realized, hold on, it's not so bad that we're being stigmatized. Some of us that prefer not to work with biggest and most popular brands, but rather work with everything else, right? Which to me, it looks like, isn't there more? <laughs> Don't you see that as being, give you more opportunities? It's either one against everything else. So anyway, long story short, I decided to change my sides on this because I, I realized, look, it's not that we're being stigmatized. It's not that bad, but it's being taken advantage by I won't say some brand because it's, it's also some other companies and so on to hide behind the idea that they're doing beam, like true beam, not that open beam thing that doesn't really work, but beam, right? And then they say, all right, we end them with this brand. When I think, no, 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 it's actually the opposite. We're getting this wrong. What, what we meant with beam is what you think open beam is, right? Everything else is a narrow part of it. Right? Because I know you know this, the IFC schema and the dictionary is so wide and big that currently, at least currently, no single brand or piece of application can do it all. It just can't, right? There's so many things from the domains all the way down to the single capabilities. You don't have a piece of software that does the modeling, but also do also do the programming and therefore creating the IFC entities for roles and, and companies and activities and so on. There isn't, right? 
No, no, you have uh, IFC Open Shell with Blender Beam, of course, which is a replica of, uh, but uh, not official ones. No, uh, they just have MVDs, which are subsets of IFC schema, right? Exactly. You know, it's an old concept. Probably eventually the IFC dictionary will need to make some progress in, in that area and move into, into a way to distribute the information that is based is not based on those narrow channels, which were necessary. Again, they were absolutely necessary. It's still valid. It's still today, I need to use them. You need to use them. But eventually, we'll, we're going to have to leave them behind. Just like, for instance, the concept, which is once again, one of those misconceptions of interoperability with BIM, of course, having to be done with file containers, information containers, what we normally call a file, right? And it's, of course, it's ingrained even in the ISO standards. If you read them, you'll see that when they talk about the exchange of information, and I don't know why they did it, to be honest, I think they're going to have, eventually they're going to amend that to allow for technology to cover that in a better way, because they're still relying on the fact of information containers, right? As if it was a file. Now, the term itself can be interpreted in different ways, but it might be misleading because currently and in the near future, there's going to be much better ways to exchange information that are not based on, I'll send you my file, you send me yours, which is the current state of affairs, right? That's what typically happens when we're doing these so-called federations and so on. Instead, individual vendors, which have the advantage of uh, managing the entire environment, have gone through a different way of exchanging information because they can control the entire the systems environment, right? With the, the cloud services and so on, such that they can actually, they can share the information at the level of the parameter, mm -hmm. right? Now, you want that. We want to make sure that that happens, but at the level of IFC schemas such that eventually you get a point where you actually have an IFC server of some kind, it doesn't have to be called like that, but it needs to be a server and you might be working on, say, uh, I hate to name brands, but we need to call something. Let's say you're using Tecla, right? And I'm using Archicad or even SketchUp, whatever I want to use. And then we should be able to be exchanging information, but not for me sending you a file and putting it there so that you can see it. Mm. I would like your software and my software to push and pull information from that cloud such yeah. that I may own the shape of the column, but it is up to you to set the strength of the material, mm -hmm. but it's the same item. So let's take a couple of steps back. What I'm referring there is the fact that the information exchange should be happening at that level, should be happening like that. And it's not ridiculously impossible. I'm not talking about something 20 years from now. I'm not paid or anything, but a couple of examples that can do that. Geometry Gym was doing that. A Speckle is doing that. And they, I still believe they, they still have their GitHub repository. So if they still might be open sourced, it's a private company. They I believe they're eventually going to charge for it, but because it's still alpha things, but it proves the concept. It can be done. IFC Git, you missed my post, but I, I think this is a concept that could work actually, right? But it's still very early, but Git is used for programming, right? I do not see, like, I was thinking like 10 years ago, why don't we have some, like, a revision history and a way of working with data that programmers use? Why could not that use with, for us, not work for us? Because we still work with data. Everything is, it should work. And I think IFC Git could prove that concept. Yes. I, I believe you won't find anyone who will be against the idea, but we deal with a legacy of dealing with paper that we have managed to turn into digital assets by using PDFs, but the PDF is essentially a paper on the screen, right? I think we'll eventually get there. I hope it's not going to take another generation, but... No, no, no. But less than... <laughs> Chat GPT will help us go quicker. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to have this same conversation in 10 years when we, <laughs> we're dealing with... No, 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 no. But maybe not a large level. I think here is going to be an advantage for smaller projects and for open-minded architects and engineers who want to employ these tools. And the, the more popular Blender Beam will become, the more people will use it because there are people using it actually in production, just this tool. They don't use other, any other tools. It can happen. Regarding Open Beam, let me make one. Let's try to wrap this up because I think we can talk like weeks for, uh, on this topic. And I completely agree with you. There was no need to use this open beam term like for me 
if you don't have collaboration, you don't have BIM. You, you cannot have information management without collaborating, without opening your data and transmitting it in an open way. Like you don't have BIM if you are limited by a platform or by a contract or by a stakeholder. Like that's not BIM. Correct. But do you agree with me in the following sentence? Most people confuse collaboration with file round tripping. I'll send you my file, you do something on it, and then you send it back to me and I continue working. That's a limited way of collaboration, but it starts there. But it's not the same. It's not the same, yeah. Not only is not the same, I will argue that is that idea of round trip is not a necessary condition for collaboration. But some people believe it is. Like, unless I can do that, there's no collaboration, which is not true. Well, I have the opinion that it's not true. Yeah, I see that as the first level of starting to collaborate because what you are saying from my point of view, from my understanding, to avoid that, so you need to plan and to collaborate from the start to work in these platforms where everyone have access to the same data. How otherwise? Of pieces of technology, software in this case for us, that can read the same format. Right? And that closes, that narrows down the whole thing. Just to give you another analogy that I use when I'm talking about these things. Mm -hmm. And I hate to, once again, I need to name brands because there's no other way to, no, it's okay. to, to do it. But it is the same thing. You probably have suffered from this because we are very likely in the same generation of work experience. And along the, your working life, you probably had to face the following problem. I definitely did, right? You work on an office environment and you need to get a document done. And there are three people involved. They all need to chime in, give their opinions, edit, maybe write one bit. The other guy needs to write the other bit. And then what happens in this start flipping back and forth Word document. And then you end up with three, four different versions and nobody knows what the hell is going on there. That's exactly the even more basic issue. But that's what I meant by round tripping. We will have the idea that you need to send me a file and you need to do something on it and then I'll send it back and maybe I did some changes on it. So now I have two different versions of the thing that should be the same. Now, that's the round tripping concept. On the other hand, and at the very same time, something like Google Docs was already up and running. Exactly. Yeah. Is it that different or difficult? Why is it that you can't make the mind shift and say, well, let's do it that way instead. Yeah, because of going out of comfort zone is not so easy for everyone and uh, we are comfortable using our own tools and so on. There might be some limitations when there might be projects where you cannot use that kind of tools you need to have offline. But I completely get and not only that, now you can actually collaborate in Word documents as well. There are more, it's not as easy as in Google Docs. That's the problem because I, I use both. And I love much more the way you can collaborate in Google Docs, but you can still do it in Word, just that involves more user access control that you need to do and to deal with. Yeah, that's the problem. It's not to throw dirt at, at Microsoft whatsoever, but it is the nature of the, those tools, the way they evolved. You know, when, when Google started with the concept of documents, they were already planning to do everything on the cloud, so, so based on the browser. Well, uh, Microsoft have to deal with the legacy of the way their software operates, the way they were doing things before and compatibility. So it's fine. That's a point where we can leave the analogy because the analogy did its work. Now we know what we're talking about when we're saying most, what I'm saying, most people confuse collaboration with that, that entry level collaboration as in the, you know, send me the word file and send you mine. When both the technology and the world is ready for something else like congruent collaboration where you don't need a file container to do that you can easily just do it from your side and my side eventually we'll get there i think you know you're right it's uh, the collaboration is a thing an obstacle in the sense that there are far too many misconceptions on that that's one of them or one of the ones that is uh, quite a big one you touch perfectly like i completely agree with you at the same time, I need to be grounded a bit because I still see an issue that we are not there yet at that first level of collaboration. I still hear a lot of horror stories where people don't share even files. Are you kidding me? So what you are talking, you are talking about utopia for me. That's why, but I completely agree that that, that is the ideal. <laughs> yeah, no, we have to separate and I hope I'm, I'm not coming wrong to you wrong in this way. We have to separate because when we're talking about these things, we're talking about 
the way things ought to be, not the way things are. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, two days from now, for me, Monday morning, I have to come back to the way things are, right? I know what I'm going to. I know that I need to fight for that ideal of what, what I want things to be actually come true. And I'll do whatever it's in my, you know, capability, which is bits and pieces, you know, one project at a time, plus a Twitter account and some followers on LinkedIn to try to push, look, a better way of doing things is not that far away. I feel like preaching, right? Like being preacher. Trust me, there's a promised land somewhere near. You just need to push a little bit more. I completely agree. IFC schema is going just to evolve. They plan to implement a linked data or IFC mm. schema to some degree. It is in a way like linked data, but they plan to like IFC 5 is going to be really cool, but it's going to be maybe in 28. I don't know when that's going to come around, but it's going just to evolve, right? So we will get there. But now again about OpenBeam, because why when I use OpenBeam, because I use OpenBeam, what I mean with OpenBeam, and I don't like because again, I wanted to use only Beam because that's Beam, as you said, with that level of collaboration. And thank you very much for explaining that difference between run tripping and real collaboration, what that means. Because that's actually what I think when I was thinking BIM. That is how you do BIM, right? But we are so far away from that, and be realistically speaking. And then why what I mean by open BIM when I say and I use open BIM, I mean that BIM in a way that you are not limited by any platform. This is what I mean, that you can access your information and you are not limited by a specific vendor, but you can actually use open standards that you can use your data. Yeah, we agree completely on that side. So there's no disagreement out there. I may have an issue still with the with the terms we use. I'm not sure your history will put me right or wrong. I'm not going to die on, on that hill, really. But yeah, I think we are on the same page on that. And hopefully, uh, let's have the same conversation in about five years and see how far have we gone. Yeah, you know, I think for us, for us too, that will not change. BIM will still be BIM that we thought it should be. Like, this is one of the many reasons I started this podcast. Because I wanted to understand why are people referring to BIM only to as a 3D model? Is that, why do we need open BIM? Questions like this, right? I had the same, like the ideal idea was in my head from the beginning, but after years, it started to be better and better articulated. And now it come to this pinnacle where actually, to be honest, the way you explained collaboration to me was something that I had all the time in my head, but I never described it exactly how you did. And when you said it, it just clicked. Okay, this is what I meant all the time, but I just did not articulate it in that way until now, you know, but this will not prevent like we, you and me, we cannot control. We can influence, of course helping people to understand, debating about these misconceptions, but we cannot prevent companies saying that they are doing open beam because they are using some concepts, some standard of open beam, right? They are using some IFC files or whatever, right? And they say they are open beam, but is it like, what do you mean by open beam? It's a tool that it's a format, it's a standard, what it is, or it's something that you can access, uh, right? Well, for some of them was also a marketing tool, fairly good marketing tool, which is yeah. fine. Like I'm, I have nothing against brands, even the brands that I don't use. I absolutely have nothing against them. It is because of them that the technology has growth and, and moves ahead. We may not agree in the particularities, but we also have to recognize that they have an obligation to their shareholders and, you know, they're going to pursue dollars before a gift to us that may happen now or three years later. So it's all understood. Our conversation is at the level of the people on the field mm -hmm, mm -hmm. having to confront the actual issues. We're not really, we're not behind a desk in a company, you know, 20 stories above thinking what's going to be the version of my software two years from now. We're facing the issues on the software as it, uh, in the practices as it is uh, as a consequence of what the software vendors do really. And this is space that you open uh, both on your podcast, but then other written social media accounts, I think offers the opportunity to you know, dig deeper in these concepts, which I really appreciate. You know, the, the fact that you're bringing this to an open conversation so that people are aware there is, you know, conversations happening on that. There is more nuance to the concepts than simply just signing off 
on a brand or signing off on a concept and then do the, the rest of the broom been washing. I really appreciate you doing that. Uh, I think it's a great idea that you keep doing it after some time. I think it's, you have done a great effort of keeping it alive. There's a lot of both accounts and podcasts that die off six months after they start. So it's all good on you. Congratulations. Thank you. Can't believe how much of an effort it has to be to keep both a family going in a job and then a podcast. So thank you very much for that. It's an effort that I'm not sure if you, if you get the kudos for it, but it is truly appreciated. I get it once in a while, and I also appreciate it when it happens. And uh, as you say, it's not easy. And the most difficult part is actually to be consistent. But I have a message to you now. This time, I really plan to stay consistent for a longer period of time. I don't plan to set it on hold anytime soon. I really want to keep publishing a weekly episode from now on for a long time. And I try to plan better this and to do it, to execute it better. So I don't get in that situation where I'm just overwhelmed by everyday life and I just don't have that consistency. And I, I have a fall off a few months and then I come back again. I'm trying to record earlier these interviews and to have more time to prepare them. And uh, it's very nice. Thank you very much for the nice words. It's very nice to see that it helps to some degree, once in a while, sometimes, because, you know, podcasts are mostly for inspiration, I would say. I used to listen to some podcasts, like an audiobook as well. And I do that when I'm training, when I drive to and from work, right? Commute entertainment. Yes, yes. They have their place. So even if it's not like something that, yeah, I need to do this all the time, like, Once in a while, I have this uh, maybe a few weeks when I listen very intensely what I missed uh, lately and so on. And I try to talk and I'm still learning, you know, like every time I talk to somebody, I'm learning. Today, I learned a lot. Like that explanation for collaboration was something that I could not describe in my head. I felt it from a sentimental point of view and conceptual, but I did not describe it. And today you blessed me with that <laughs> description, <laughs> which I'm very, very grateful for. And uh, yeah. Like, this is a... Uh... I might be a preacher after all, the beam preacher. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we need to, to question the, the stuff we are doing and why not doing openly? There are definitely other people that can be inspired or can help either with the conversation or with the implementation or with something else. Yeah, again, as I said half an hour ago, <laughs> I feel that we could talk like for hours or days. This is what is so cool about this uh, community. We are not closed only by one concept. Like uh, we can talk about many things. And the uh, important is that people don't have time to think about it in their everyday life, right? Because being coordinators and being modelers and everyone at work, they don't have time to what is uh, really open beam means, right? What do we really yeah. need that? No, I need to deliver this. My client required me these models. I need to check these models. I need to make sure that my team will get the models on site. You know, this is what I'm thinking when I go to work. I You don't get time for this. But it's cool to have these communities, a YouTube video where you can comment on it, right? You can tell me that makes sense or tell me your point of view, right? We can talk a lot about this, but let's wrap it up. Tell me how people can reach out to you. My company, you can find the company that I'm the director of, the builddigital.com.au or my personal Twitter account at Nando Mogollon with double L. You can find me on LinkedIn by my name, Nando Mogollon. I keep posting. Those are probably the, the two that I post most oftenly, more often. Yeah, I can confirm that because there is where we interact and actually there is where we, we got to know each other. And uh, yeah, that's how I decided to invite you for a chat. So you said something. LinkedIn is more formal. It's getting, it's still a form, more formal uh, social uh, media network, while Twitter is more casual, right? So most of the most, the more interesting conversations happen uh, on uh, Twitter, actually, right? Have you ever been to a conference in the industry? BIM conference, build expo thingy of some kind. So LinkedIn seems like the conference itself, when everyone is dressing up and cordially exchanging information. And then link, uh, Twitter is like the bar after. Afterwards. <laughs> and then you really start commenting when you really think about things. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, but you know, some people are also comfortable uh, commenting on LinkedIn as well. But sometimes you would be amazed by what people on LinkedIn would comment on. 
like general stuff, you know, not not professional stuff, but general stuff. It's crazy. But like in our line of work, most people are not doing that. But sometimes I get some topics, very interesting topics with thousands of uh, comments. People with their LinkedIn profiles, what would they dare to write on LinkedIn? It's quite crazy, to be honest. You would be surprised about that. But uh, we are on uh, on the safer side. <laughs> Yeah, we found, I found a comment the probably like a year ago or something. There was, you know, typical thing like a, a post, very, I will say very corporate post. Oh, we're very proud to announce that we're you know, working on this project, blah, blah, blah. And then somewhere down the comments, someone started a rant over how bad the project manager was or who knows, what, some, some comment completely off, off tone, right? And, and then there was a back and forth probably just a couple of comments long. And then the last comment, which was the one that cracked me, was a, guys, guys, this is not Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it up to yourselves. This is not Facebook. Yeah, yeah, you get to see that quite often. Yeah. Do you have a message for everyone listening or watching this? Go model something. Go make <laughs> something. Go export something to IFC. <laughs> Try it. It's not painful. Try it. Thank you very much, Nando. It was a blast and uh, we should definitely talk again sometimes in the future. We will. We will. <laughs> Thanks, Petro. Thanks for the invite and uh, it was my pleasure. Thank you.